Wednesday, August 13th, 2014, Ordinance Committee to order. Uh, Councillor Katarina? Here. Councillor Benedict? Here. Chairman Sullivan? Here. And Tom is here also, the town manager. <coughs> Item number three, approval of the minutes from May 28th, 2014. Do I have? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Good. Yes. Okay, item number four, which I'm assuming the majority of you <laughs> are all here for, uh, is the discussion on the wireless facilities. Um, we're going to do it a little bit differently today. Um, we're going to have Dan Bacon. Uh, he's going to make his presentation first, and then, um, because I think I have a feeling that a lot of the things that Dan says today may help answer some questions or explain some things for people. Then we'll move on. Um, I think we're going to hear hopefully from the planning board a little bit, and then we're going to move on to public comments. So that's how we're, we're kind of switching it up a little bit. So uh, Dan, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, and we're here before you. Uh, obviously, the, the wireless facility proposal has been to the town council for a couple of different meetings, um, first reading and, and your public hearing, and also had a public hearing by the planning board. And uh, both the planning board, the public, and the council have, have given us some feedback in terms of how really to kind of thread the needle uh, between improving uh, wireless coverage in the town's poor coverage areas, which is the charge of the ordinance committee quite some time ago, while balancing that with a measure minimizing impacts in terms of property value impacts, proximity to residential neighborhoods, scenic views, kind of visual impacts. So uh, since the council's public hearing, we've taken another look at the, that proposal, and the ordinance committee has uh, in your packages, and there's some handouts as well, um, two different things. One, one of the handouts is a memo from staff to the Ordinance Committee dated August 1st that outlined some additional uh, measures to consider. Um, and then um, the second handout is a more recent concept which kind of builds on that first handout that, that suggests a hierarchy in terms of reviewing the siting of new wireless facilities in Scarborough. Um, so I'll quickly touch on the first memo and then the second memo and, and then turn it back to you, uh, Madam Chair. Perfect. Um, so using that memo, uh, one of the things that is a, is a recommendation from staff is to go a bit further in terms of um, challenging and, and requesting uh, providers, the wireless industry, to um, first see if there can be a co-location uh, of additional antennas on existing towers before a new tower is proposed somewhere in the community. And uh, we have some language that can do that more than the original proposal. The original proposal said that new towers going in should be designed to, to handle co-location if, say, only a few providers are going on initially, uh, that they can be expanded, added to. But there wasn't language suggesting that first you need to look as an installer to co-locate on an existing tower before you decide to build new. So that's an improvement uh, in the ordinance that could encourage that. There's been concerns in terms of the scenic views, the visual impacts of, of towers, particularly in the rural areas or along the marsh. Um, so one measure that can be taken is to lessen the allowed height of towers modestly. Uh, the report that the consultant did suggested 130 feet would be practical for a co-location of four different providers on most towers in town, uh, or a new tower, um, but the original proposal was 150. So you could consider going back to 130. Again, that's 20 feet less in terms of being above the tree cover and, and being more obvious from surrounding properties and views, et cetera. But then also allow a provision where if there's really good reasons to go up to 150, that case can be made to the planning board and they would need to be the judge of whether those are um, suitable reasons to, to elevate, which could be 
avoiding building a new tower nearby, which might be one of those good reasons, or that there's no difference in terms of views um, based on buffering, based on the location of a new tower. So that's a consideration for the uh, Ordinance Committee in terms of minimizing visual impact. Another item is, is looking at um, greater setbacks and greater lot size in the residential zones where these are proposed to be allowed. There's been, that's been the thrust of the concern um, by the public through the, the process is proximity to homes, proximity to neighborhoods um, that may happen in the rural and farm district uh, in particular. And that's a zone that's proposed to allow these as well as the village residential four. Um, and given concerns about um, property value impacts, views, um, sort of incompatibilities with na neighborhoods, consideration could be given to increasing the, the setback to more in the 150%, 200% of tower height versus 100%, um, which then requires larger pieces of property and, and ensures towers are located further away from uh, neighboring properties and neighboring homes. Likewise, or in the same vein, you could increase the minimum lot size to, to four acres, um, potentially up to six or 10 acres um, to ensure that the sites are large and, and out of the way and, and not close to neighbor, neighborhoods or abutters. Um, and that could help as well in that regard. So that's something for the committee to consider. And that would be only, for, only be for the residential rural zones versus the industrial and crossroads district where it's proposed to be allowed in the current draft. Um, so along those same lines, to kind of incentivize locating in the industrial zones or the crossroads district, which is a commercial zone in the center of town, um, there can be lesser setbacks and no minimum lot size for, for towers in those locations. Um, and that would make it easier to site in those locations and, and encourage exploration of those areas before um, going to the rural areas of town. In terms of aesthetics, which has been brought up, um, there could be some consideration for requiring a specific type of tower if a tower is going to go in, such as a monopole style. Those are the ones that are um, perhaps less industrial looking. They, they blend in a bit better. I think the industry considers them as being more aesthetically pleasing. Um, and I think those generally work for co-location and for the heights of towers that the town is talking about. Um, they wouldn't work so well if you're talking about 200 to 400 foot towers given their, their uh, structural integrity. But So that's something to, to consider um, and that could help with uh, the aesthetic piece and kind of fitting into the landscape um, and requiring that the color be a sky tone that, that would blend in quite well as opposed to um, a more industrial style tower. And as a, as a final topic, um, and this came up to some degree with the planning board, um, there could be some additional uh, standards on the buffering and vegetative screening uh, involved with towers, particularly in the rural and farming district. Um, again, to, to make sure if it's a wooded site that there's only clearing done necessary for the installation of the tower, which can, if, if they're mature trees and it's a larger property, um, that could be very effective in screening uh, views of the tower. Um, and also, given the planning board some flexibility on larger sites to say if there's a large site that's half field and half wooded, um, give the planning board some flexibility on ha working with the applicant to site the tower in the least um, visible location to, to again help with concerns about scenic impacts, property value impacts, things like that. Um, so that's generally speaking what's been thought about since your public hearing and what's in the Ordinance Committee uh, memo. And we have worked on some language that could begin to get us in, uh, moving in that direction on those uh, particular refinements. And then more recently, uh, and that's the second uh, memo and, and handout that's available, is it's 
kind of couple those ideas with uh, a process or a hierarchy that both an applicant and the planning board would have to go through as uh, they're considering uh, siting new installations in town. And that would would really be to, or a stepped process, and that would really be tasking the applicant to first consider co-location on existing towers or expanding existing towers, so using existing infrastructure out there. If that's inadequate or doesn't meet the need uh, in terms of um, the poor coverage areas or the area they're interested in serving, then they can move to a step two, which would be consider locating a tower um, in the industrial district or the crossroads district, which is the commercial zone. So the zones that um, these have been allowed in the past or are deemed um, least impactful in and would fit in the best. Um, and they would need to consider <coughs> potential tower locations in those areas um, and that may serve the need. If it doesn't serve the need, then they can uh, demonstrate that to the planning board and then they can move to the next uh, the next step, which could be particularly in the residential areas or the rural areas, um, considering a stealth uh, installation that's attached to a building that's within a church steeple, that's attached to a higher transmission line uh, utility pole, uh, something that's building on existing infrastructure, not putting in a new tower, um, which would you would think would get to kind of the concerns about scenic impacts and, and, and that type of thing. Um, and that may serve the need in a particular area that's, that needs improved coverage. If that's demonstrated the planning board to, to not be practical or, or adequate, then the final step would be uh, a trip to the planning board and a proposal for one in the, the rural farming or the village residential four district, the residential zones. Um, but along with those additional standards in terms of setback and perhaps larger lot size so that if it does end up in the, the rural districts that it's adequately uh, cited and, and minimizing impacts that are concerned about. So those are a lot of different ideas um, that we've tried to, to uh, consider uh, to get this sort of in the right place in terms of balancing improved coverage but also concerns about you know, proximity to, to neighborhoods and um, the other uh, scenic impacts, so. Great, thanks. Would you, um, do you mind taking a couple questions sure. from the counselors? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, Dan, I know in speaking with uh, folks in the community, one of the uh, suggestions that's been made, and it's come up a couple times, is the concept of using contract zoning. Could you talk to me about why that does or doesn't work? Um, contract zoning is certainly a zoning approach that can be used for uses that the town didn't contemplate. It's, it's generally referred to, it's reserved for um, activities, land uses that weren't really planned for or thought of, but are good ideas that the town can work with an applicant on. Um, I don't know that it's a great application for expanding wireless coverage uh, in terms of giving the industry guidance as to what the town's concerned about in terms of setbacks in location and a buffering and it doesn't, it's more of a reactive um, zoning technique than a, than a proactive kind of planning for something but um, having a set of recommendations on how that that land use can be can fit within the, the community and the landscape. So oh. yes, go ahead. Um, so does contract zoning set us up in any way uh vis a vis federal rules or, you know, for example that you're is, is it like setting out telecommunications is something that's unique? When it's not, and now the, and I'm not, I'm probably not asking the question correctly, uh, where you know it's like saying, oh well, telecommunications that's very unique and 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 should be treated way differently than we treat churches or shopping centers or or whatever. Uh, is is that a possibility? Well, that we, you could you could contract zoning would be not the best way to do it. 
because of that. Well, I think the town, under the federal uh, Telecommunication Act, has an obligation to provide some means for expansion of right. wireless service in the community. It doesn't need to allow it everywhere in the community, and it has the ability to regulate it tightly if it so chooses to minimize impacts like scenic impacts and right. land use implications, you know, impacts on abutters. Um, but we do need to provide for a reasonable expansion of wireless service in the community. Um, and I don't know that just leaving it to contract zoning without clear expectations for applicants mm -hmm. and clear allowances for towers or other ways of transmitting wireless in the community is, is really going to get us there. Mm -hmm. um, okay. If that helps answer your question. Yeah, it does. Thanks. Uh, just in response, I'd further add, that really is kind of, in my view, the do-nothing approach. I mean, contract zone, we could always be approached uh, in those, mm -hmm. uh, for a contract zone, and that's always been true. Um, I think I would reiterate at Dan's point that it's really uh, the opposite of proactive planning and, right. and making sure that proper allowances are uh, and requirements are put in place for certain uses. Mm -hmm. You all set? Yes, thank you. Okay. Councillor Benedict. Uh, Dean, I just have a couple of questions. Um, the one thing that has come up with every single email I've gotten and every single person I've sat down with, nobody wants it in the residential neighborhoods. I can understand that. Uh, I wouldn't want it either. Why? Why are we pushing? Or why are they pushing to be in residential areas? I think the um, well, the industry folks are here to ex answer some of that. But I think one of the challenges Scarborough has is it's a very large community, mm -hmm. and our industrial zones um, are generally in the center of the community. They're not in the two outlying areas being the western side of town and the far eastern side of town. And given the mass of Scarborough, the size of Scarborough, if service, if improvements in coverage and cell service is desired in those the west and the east, not just the, the central area, um, some consideration needs to be given to allowing for facilities in those areas, and those two areas are generally the rural and farming uh, zone, and um, that's where the ordinance committee and the town need to decide, okay, what are your expectations for improvements in coverage, and what do you consider a residential neighborhood versus a residential zone? I mean, there's neighborhoods in the rural and farming district for sure, and there's a number of them. There's also fairly large tracts of land um, that could be four, six, ten, twenty acres in size. So, is the concern siding towers in the RF zone, or is the concern siding towers close or in a residential neighborhood? And I think those are two different things. Um, and one can be dealt with. <laughs> you can <laughs> allow for towers with larger thresholds in the RF district, like larger lot size and setbacks, and try to minimize them going into residential neighborhoods. If there's a concern about towers in the RF districts altogether, then there needs to be an acceptance of no improvement, perhaps, of coverage in some of those areas, unless there are other things that can be done in the industrial zones or in terms of capacity to you know, taller towers or other engineering technical approaches that can be take, taken. So, no, it, 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 is it possible if you're going to go in a residential area um, for these to be voted on by the neighborhood that it's affecting on a one by one basis? That's unusual for uh, <laughs> um, I mean, you can do that in terms of if it's 
some degree, that's sort of the town land scenario, where if the town was an applicant into working with a tower installer, then the town council can have a process to decide whether uh, a tower goes on town land independent of the regulations. Um, but to write zoning to require someone other than the review authority, which would either be the planning board or the zoning board, um, that's highly irregular. I mean, that's not necessarily how zoning land use works. That's more of a referendum process. Or <laughs> so that's, I think that would be more difficult to do. Um, that's really the charge of the planning board or zoning board is they need to, once you write the rules, um, they need to be the judges as to whether an applicant has satisfied the rules that you've come up with or not getting input from the neighborhood, getting input from um, the applicant, and then making that decision. I think the, the feeling is um, that a lot of us are getting is that if the, na if the neighborhood, if, if there's a proposal for a tower to go up in a neighborhood and that neighborhood doesn't care that their coverage isn't very good, should should they have the right to say we don't want that tower? We don't care. We don't we don't care that our that our coverage isn't that good. I think that's is that where you were going. I had that conversation earlier today with a with um, one of our town's people as the feeling of they're proposing this tower in our neighborhood. We're satisfied with our coverage, why does the tower have to go there? I think that's where Councillor Benedict was going with that. And I, I mean I understand I understand your answer. Um, but I have a feeling that's where how a lot of people feel. So it's sort of a hard mm -hmm. it's kind of a hard tough place to be. I think it gets back to what do you consider a neighborhood? What is mm. the council, as the legislative body, ultimately right. considers acceptable in terms right. of proximity to neighborhoods or not? Mm -hmm. um, minimum lot sizes, ways to, if they are going to be allowed in zones that allow residential development, that they be on sites that you feel adequately uh, protect abutters. Um, or decide that they're not allowed in those zones. I think you, there's a decision there that needs to be made as opposed to site by site showing a right. uh, raise of hands as to who wants a tower or not. That's that's beyond the ability of zoning. Um, it's more of a an earlier decision needs to be made whether yeah. um, you're going to allow them with controls in certain areas or not. Right. Not leave it up to each location to get a vote. Well, and I think that people understand that, and we, I think we as counselors understand that. I think it's more of just trying to get that thought process out there of, you know, we've got some neighborhoods in this town that feel really strongly about they don't want towers anywhere near their neighborhood. And so, again, I see what you're saying, but we speak for the t townspeople, so I think it was I think it's important to get that piece sure. out, to get that out there. Could I just add uh, uh, maybe a further clarification to Councilor Benefits uh, Benedict's initial question? The reason residential um, residentially zoned properties are kind of in the conversation is uh, at the outset the policy objective that we understood as staff was to look at providing enhanced cell coverage in town, mm -hmm. that being kind of the goal. And so we hired an independent consultant to help us understand where those weak pockets are. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, uh, for us to meet that, even reasonably meet that policy objective, the ARP zone is smack dab in the middle of that conversation. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. so uh, it really comes back to this committee and the council, if you were wi willing to modify or back away from that um, objective of, of providing enhanced coverage, then I think the conversation becomes pretty quick and simple. <laughs> but uh, there's just certainly the dilemma if that goal still maintains. Yes. Do you have any more questions? Uh, no, I just want to say I, I, I think that it's readily unavailable, not 
available from the townspeople for towers to be going anywhere visibly in the marsh uh, for a farm, the farm we just bought down on uh, uh, what? Pleasant Hill. Pleasant Hill area. And those are the things that everybody wants to make sure they're not going to have a tower plucked in the middle of it. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, a, 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 an antenna in a, anywhere located in the visibility of the marsh would be an absolute sin. And I also want to stay away from what Cape Elizabeth is going through, where they have uh, some legal matters going between the cell phone companies and the town and they only came after the town had said, yes, you can do this, that, and the other thing. They didn't like it, so they're coming after the town. And I don't have any part of that. <coughs> That's all i got to say for now. Chairman Feldman, do you have any questions? Well, i just like to ask Council Benedict if um, that's the case, um, where's your suggestion to put them? If there are no RF zones, that means it'd be uh, west and north of the turnpike, um, there'd be no locations. I mean, it sounds like, um, are you willing to drop this whole proposal as far as uh, an ordinance to improve cell phone coverage in the town of Scarborough? Well, don't take my answer the wrong way. But I live on Burnham Road. I live two and a quarter miles from an antenna at King Farm on Route 22. Mm -hmm. And the way the crow flies, I live about two miles from, I believe, it's Stony Brook School, where they also have a tower. Mm -hmm. And for me to operate my cell phone, i got to go outside. <laughs> and even then, calls get dropped. I mean, it's absolutely horrible. And the way I've compensated personally, cost me $30 a month to have a home phone. And I'd rather spend $30 a month for a home phone than be looking two doors down and having an antenna. Okay, so in other words, your position has changed since this started. Because I heard that more it, it really hasn't well. changed. It, it's only more particulars of popping up once I heard from people mm -hmm. about people in town have gotten a, approached for, well, oh, we'll pay you 800 a month to put up an antenna. We'll pay you 1,000 a month. And I'd hate, to, I'd hate to turn around and give one, say to somebody, oh, sure, go ahead. And then two years later, they move. Scarborough was stuck with an antenna. Okay, I just I just wanted to hear a better explanation of. I like the best. That's of, good. No, I that's like good. the best of both worlds. I think we yep. need to have an increase in the ability with the cell phones, but not at the expense of the taxpayers not liking it. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> um, Madam Chair. Yes. If I could add something. To that yeah, thing. just one, just one second, yeah. please. Are you? Are you oh, going? yeah. Just, I'm just. I just had a question. Did you, did you want to ask Dan anything? No. 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 Okay. Yes. Thank Go you. ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, just along these lines, and I know I'm not going to be very popular with some people in this audience, but um, I work from many people's houses uh, as a real estate broker, not just from my house. The landline doesn't do me any good. Uh, so for me, having adequate, and I know this is me, and I'm not the only person because I've heard from a number of other business people, small business people, that having adequate uh, cell coverage and wireless coverage is critical to running our businesses uh, throughout town. So, I mean, I understand what you're saying, uh, but I think with the right um, planning and zoning in place, um, 
we can have the best of both worlds. So that's where I'm coming from with this. And I and I do think that it should be a goal of this uh, town to improve cell coverage because it is an economic development issue. That's my opinion. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dan. Really appreciate it. Um, is there planning board? Yeah. Do you um, you want to go before we allow public comments? Thank you. Yeah, please. Good afternoon. My name is Alan Paul. I'm the planning board chairperson. Um, my goal today is to maybe restate the items that concerned us when this first came to us for a public hearing. Um, I think the two biggest things that we had for a concern as it was originally written was that it was too broad in terms of what it was allowing. Mm -hmm. And it really was not something that we felt was enforceable. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the planning board, our duty, if you will, or our charge is to do our best to enforce the current zoning ordinances that are in place. It is not a board where your personal opinion really weighs much. What you personally feel is not what you're there to discuss. You're there to discuss what are the current zoning ordinances and try to do your best to enforce what's already been given. So again, I'm trying to speak as the planning board, not as Alan, all right? Um, so again, what we, would, what we really would like to see is things tightened up. I think some of the, the issues or, or a lot of the items that Dan spoke about earlier would help to, in fact, enforce just the things that we were concerned with. Um, one of the problems that we saw is that setbacks were really very, very broad. I mean, you literally could have a 150-foot tower set on the edge of a property, and if the tower fell, it could fall on somebody else's property. Don't think that's something we should be doing. We feel that the tower should be more or less self-contained on the property that it's sitting on. We don't want it to impact others. We also suggested as much as possible that the type of tower would be the type of tower that would easily blend into the environment that it's in. There are as many different styles of towers that are available. You can, I'll use the word camouflage for uh, the lack of maybe a better word, but there are ways to try to help camouflage a tower, and we thought that verbiage that would do something of that nature would be helpful also. Um, certainly the buffering issue is always one of our key concerns on the board and that language we felt needed to be tightened up as well. Um, so I, I would say that across the board, those were the primary items that we were concerned about. There certainly, and you will hear, I'm, I'm sure today, some safety concerns, some safety issues. From, our, from the board's perspective, we had people sitting on both sides of that fence. So there were some people that had those concerns. There were some people that did not have those concerns at all. So I, I you know, I think the again, um, the beauty of being, I think, on the town council is you get to have that opinion, and that's the one that matters in the end. Uh, whether you feel it's a safety concern, whether you feel it's not a safety concern, your personal feeling can come into play in your decision making process. We do our best to try to keep our personal opinions out of it. Um, <clears throat> having said that, I'll end my planning board comment. I'd like to make one personal comment if I could. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that were brought up in the questioning had to do with contract zones. As a planning board member, contract zones are probably one of the things I dislike the most. Mm. All right? they totally throw out all of the rules and regulations that have been put in place by some committees that we have here in town 
that are really doing an outstanding job. Um, if there are people who want to come into our community and want to work with us or try to do something that's not necessarily allowed in a given zone, there are other vehicles besides contract zones that I think can be very effective. The Long Range Planning Committee has been outstanding in trying to work with people in rezoning our town and has done it very, very effectively as we've imp implemented the comprehensive plan that we put in place. Um, so don't, I would ask you to hesitate before you consider a contract zone so that you don't overrule the work that's been done by some outstanding members of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Susan Oglis. I'm a member of the planning board. Um, I agree with everything that um, Alan just said, and I think that many of my concerns as a member of the planning board have been addressed by what Dan presented. It's a lot of great work because, again, just to reiterate, on the planning board, we don't get to have opinions. We only get to find out exactly what's being proposed and does it or does not match the ordinances. And the first ordinance that we saw we felt was just something we couldn't implement. There wasn't enough meat to it to implement it. And what Dan presented really makes a big difference. I think it needs some fine tuning and that will happen. I know it will happen. But the general concept of how to go about it just feels much more, um, much more stable. Just a couple of things I'll start by saying. There couldn't be anything worse for this, I don't think, than contract zones. And for all the reasons that, that Alan just said, but there's also another one. Once the contract zone is in place, they can come back and ask for it to change. And I can give you examples, but I won't take the time. There are contract zones that exist out there now, and just about every time we turn around, they're back again for another change to their contract zone. <coughs> now, that's a pain to have to deal with as a planning board, and it's very, very bad planning. And that's what we're all about is planning so that we don't end up with a town that doesn't look the way we say we want our town to be. Um, under the implementation, having said the positive words about what Dan is offering, um, the, one of the things I was most excited to hear him say is that there is a difference between residential neighborhoods and residential zones. Mm -hmm. Okay? I live right next to a residential zone. I also live in a residential neighborhood. I don't want anything in a residential neighborhood that's a cell tower. I shouldn't say that. That is not my primary choice. But a zone, because if we're talking about out in the western part of the, the town, there are large pieces of property in which you could put in a cell tower that is well camouflaged, well positioned, obviously big enough so that if it falls over, it doesn't hit anything. Um, but when you start talking about putting them in residential neighborhoods, I think we're talking about something different, and that has to really be looked at very carefully by, by the committee. Um, okay, now a process thing. I'm a member of the Long Range Planning Committee, and I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and pat ourselves all over the backs because we do good work. Almost everything we've come up with that we present to the council for passage in terms of zoning changes or new zoning gets accepted by the council almost inevitably, and it's because of the process we go through. The process for making this happen in a way that is not going to end up dividing the community and make a mess every time somebody wants to put in a tower, I think could take a page from the Long Range Planning Committee's process. And one is there supposedly are already identified insufficient locations for coverage in Scarborough. I would suggest that we need to know what they are. They need to be identified. And the people who want to put up towers need to say we want one here, 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 and here. Now that's eight. We only need five. So let's work on which five of those eight meet the criteria that I'm hoping you're going to come up with as a result of what Dan has said. Okay? Now that you've got these places identified, if they are not in a neighborhood and they're all in just zones, that's going to be a very different approach than if some of them have to end up being in neighborhoods. So now you know where your trouble spots are. So rather than waiting until an ordinance is written and they come in front of you for, um, for um, uh, citizen input, you can have citizen input from them before you decide. Work with them. 
tell them that these are the five. Do you like them or not like them and come and talk to us about why? We always do that with the neighborhoods that we're affecting. Do you like this? Do you not like it? And what would you like to see? It's called compromise. And this can also be done through the efforts of compromise. And I think that's it. I just want to say thank you very much for having taken the time to um, really seriously take a look at what the planning board said. We feel heard, and that's very important to us since we're the ones that are going to implement whatever it is you ultimately pass. So thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> I think now we're going to move to public comments. Um, I would ask that we're going to follow the same standards that the council meetings follow, three minutes. Please try to keep it under three minutes. Um, and if you're going to speak, we need your name and address. And if you're going to speak, please um, head towards the podium, just because that way we can kind of keep it moving a little bit faster. Um, I do want to also say um, our, our plan for what this is going to do, because I think that might help. Oh, in terms of where it yeah. goes from here? Yeah, I think that might help before we start comments. Yeah, perhaps I could make two okay. comments that might satisfy and answer some questions and comments I've heard. Yeah. Uh, uh, the first is some of the, the locations that many folks have reacted to. Yeah. I'll accept responsibility and, and blame, should it be considered that. Um, when we engaged the consultant, I had them not only look at uh, and identify where the weak coverage was, but I said, and by the way, once we know that, identify all town property and uh, a handful of private property within those weak areas. And so a list of 13 or 11, I'm sorry, sites were identified. Uh, that's not at all to suggest that a tower will go there. Um, right. And the beauty of the town sites is that the council decides. It is a decision among these seven. So I apologize for creating any misunderstanding or, or even hysteria in the, in the eyes of some just because a site was mentioned here does not at all mean that it's going to, one will go there. Beyond that, this matter is scheduled for second reading before the council next Wednesday, August 20. Uh, I'm not aware of any burning desire. Um, in fact, uh, we seem to have spent a lot of time on this, and I think there's an interest in getting it right. So uh, certainly the council, if it wished, could delay it slightly further. Um, or you can do what, we, what you will, will with it, but uh, that's a possibility. My suggestion at this point is for us to take this and send it back to the planning board to give them, there's, the planning board has a meeting, um, Dan, right in between our, this meeting and our, not next council meeting, but the council meeting following. Um, Right, for the planning board to look at this one more time um, to help help us fine tune it. Um, it gives the citizens more time for input, um, which I think will be helpful. The more input we get, the better outcome we're going to have. Um, and then what will happen is, so it'll go from us to the planning board, the planning board will fine tune it, and it will come back to ordinance for one more final look through before we pass it back to the council. So what will happen is that the next council meeting next week, this ordinance will be tabled until we have time to really make sure we're giving the council a great full final package. That's at least my feeling on it. Um, I don't see any need to rush it. Um, I think we've learned, or at least I have learned, that that gets us nowhere and it's not necessary. Um, so that is my plan. So that being said, <laughs> I'm just going to keep like rumbling. Um, name and address, please, in yes, three minutes. My name is Mo Erickson. I live at 288 Pine Point Road. And um, I'm actually not even here concerning the cell phone stuff. I'm here for something totally different that affects me and, and my neighborhood, and that is the continued parking down on the Pine Point Road, down by the Clam Bake, and the landing. And um, I just, I, I want, every time I complain to the police about it, they tell me that I need to speak to the ordinance committee, so here I am. Um, I can tell you that I feel like every now and then there comes a, up a, a problem, 
and um, we grapple with trying to find a solution when the solution is really easy, and it is stop letting cars park along that road right there. I can tell you that cars are now parking from the rotary. Uh, they did put an, implement a no parking in front of the fire hydrant, but they park from there all the way back to Depot Road and then past Depot Road. Um, they park in the bike lane, so all the people coming from Bailey's Campground and all the bikers are all coming and using that bike lane, but now there are cars there. So now all of those people with their wagons, little kids, um, walkers, runners, are now forced to go in the road. Um, and also what's happening is on a really nice sunny day, people are now parking along the curb in front of the clam bake. So now we have cars on both sides. My husband um, is a clammer, and he tells me all the clam diggers, they pull, bring their clams down to Bailey's under a depot road there, and when they try to pull out, they cannot see. They have boats behind them. But really, it's, it's a real hazard, and I'm just begging you to stop parking there. Plus, you're losing all that revenue because nobody wants to park at the municipal parking lot anymore because they can park there. And I can just tell you that I have four kids, and if one of my kids gets hit by a car there, you're going to see me more than you ever thought possible. So I just I urge you to go down there on a really hot, sunny day and see the confusion. You have people going to the Clambake restaurant trying to turn in on two entrances. You have people coming from Bailey's campground with wagons and bikes and kids. You have just your regular runners and bicyclists, um, all the clam diggers, and all just people going to the beach, and it's a fiasco. The simple, the simple solution is to stop parking there. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gina Christie. I live at One Metalwood Drive in Scarborough. Um, as a homeowner here in Scarborough, I'm here to implore you not to pass any zoning changes. Please keep cell phone taps in industrial zones and off our utility poles and allow our town to decide where the new cell towers go, not the wireless companies. I also want to say that I love our town and I don't want to witness the detrimental effects that this blight is going to have not only on our property values, but our health and the beauty of our town. We already live in a world that's bombarded by electronics. We've got more than ample opportunity to use them whenever we need to. Scarborough neither needs nor wants further bombardment of this type. You know, I moved here from California to escape that. And let me tell you, we've got something special here. And I think you need to think about, is this really the direction you want to take our town in? You know, I implore you again to consider that very carefully before your proposed actions cause something special in this town to be lost forever. I believe that you became a part of town council to hear our voices and act upon the wishes of the townspeople. And I hope you hear us now. Thank you. Anybody else? I did. Yeah, I no. thought that's what I. If you are going to speak, can you just start forming a line, just so we don't have to. Hi, hi, Karen DeAndre, Eagles Nest Drive. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, I had planned to come here to say a whole bunch of different stuff, but I've kind of changed because I really am liking what I'm hearing. Um, I've looked over the memos. Uh, I think we're going down the right road. Well, I don't think we're quite there yet, but I think there's a good process that started. I really appreciated what Susan Oglis had to say about neighborhoods and, and, um, and zoning. Um, I thought that that was really important. So I won't reiterate what she said, but I will just say ditto. Um, my only other sort of thought that I wanted to bring up right now is we already have towers. 
communications towers in Scarborough, and so they must have gotten put there under some kind of process. So at some point, I would love to know what that process was and how those cell towers got to be where they are. That's it. Oh, and thank you. Thank you. Next. Hello, my name is Alicia Emmerich, and I'm at uh, 3 Haystack Circle. Um, I do appreciate the updates that Mr. Bacon um, presented to us today. Um, however, I just wanted to express that we are not at all interested in any cell phone towers, no matter what updates are provided in the proposal. Um, and on this issue, we will not compromise. Um, I was looking at the first sheet dated August 1st um, uh, that Dan provided that uh, will now limit the tower height to 130 feet. In 1995, it was 100 feet, and the um, procedural guideline specifically stated that was due to safety issues um, with falling ice, et cetera. Those safety issues have not gone away, um, and the way and to increase it uh, to 130 feet is ridiculous. I mean, it's it's a typical ploy. First, you say oh, 150, and then you reduce it to 130, and the, the taxpayer thinks we're getting a deal, but we're not stupid. Um, we, do, we do not want the cell phone towers in our neighborhood, and they should be limited to the current uh, standards, which was safe in 1995. Um, the other fact that I mentioned at the last meeting is that lighting was also addressed in 1995, um, and um, from what I understand, there are, are air, line, um, uh, air safety guidelines for lighting cell phone towers over a certain feet number of feet, so that has not been addressed. So I'm sure no one wants to see a 130-foot tower with lights or a 150-foot tower with lights. Um, nothing has been mentioned by Mr. Bacon um, on that issue. Um, <coughs> on the uh, <coughs> second sheet, um, I just wanted to say step three and four we are definitely not interested in. We, we do not want cell phone towers in our neighborhood. Um, we have rural farming zoning. We will not permit a unilater unilateral change in our zoning to accommodate backroom deals held by our town officials. At the last meeting, it was brought up that if a resident is having signal issues, they can easily purchase a booster for their home <clears throat> or simply reinstall their home phone line, as um, Mr. Benedict explained. I question why we spent thousands of dollars as a town on IDK consulting to, to, to give us a map of where we need the cell phone coverage. This is a complete waste of taxpayer money. That money could have been spent to purchase the booster box for the people who were complaining, and then none of us would have to deal with um, have cell phone towers in a, proposed in our neighborhood. It is clear to our citizens that this is not an issue driven by cell phone coverage need, but, but driven instead by greed as an attempt to increase cash flow to our town at our expense. Um, through the past few months, I've seen this town jump through ho hoops to provide um, health, health, a healthy living situation for four piping plovers. So I guess all what we, what we have to do here is claim that somehow the cell phone towers would damage plover and, uh, habitats, and we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Thank you. I'm Karen Tangway from 4010 Lane. Um, it's my sincere hope that you not only will not will we refrain from adding a cell tower to Wiley Field, but that you'll keep the RF zones unchanged. Between possible health issues which could emerge in the future, property values and aesthetics, it is desirable to keep cell towers out of neighborhoods and locate them in industrial zones. I just want to mention um, the subject was brought up about camouflaging cell towers, and I've seen some pictures of cell towers camouflaged as trees, <laughs> and they they rise up way above the natural tree line like horticultural aliens, <laughs> <laughs> and they really don't look like trees. So in in our Wiley Field, we've got probably 80-foot trees, and we're talking about a 130-foot tower, which is 
going to be one heck of a tree sticking up there, okay? I want to mention that um, part of Benjamin's farm does abut Wiley Field, and we would like to see that farm re remain an unchanged RF zone that would not house a cell phone tower. I feel it is an essential not to pass an ordinance that would change RF zones in any way. In Scarborough, we are a community of people who love our town, and we want to protect and preserve it. We don't wish to discourage cell phone towers, as they are certainly needed. We simply believe that they do not belong in or close to residential neighborhoods. Industrial zones would seem to be the best home for cell towers. I also believe that it would be in the best interest of the town to not allow wireless companies to contract with property owners for the purpose of erecting cell towers on said properties. I think the problems too numerous to imagine would emerge from this. And I would like to see the town in charge of when and where towers, towers would go rather than having this dictated by the wireless companies. I believe that in the long run it can be a win-win for everyone involved to protect the health and integrity of neighborhoods and place new towers in industrial zones. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Laura Hannon of 17 Powderhorn Drive. I'm in the Pleasant Hill area and I would not like to see a tower in that area or any other residential areas or rural or farming areas. Um, I would like to share a story. I just got back from visiting my parents in Los Angeles. They live in a suburb, and the cell reception there is, is just terrible. And uh, my girlfriend of many years, she bought a house about a mile away, and she has no cell service. Cell service. Cell service. Sorry. <laughs> um, she spent about a half a million dollars for her house, and I said, "Wow, you you moved into a place with no cell service." And she says, "Yeah, but you know, the beautiful, the view is lovely. Everybody wants to live here. This is a great town." And I got curious. I said, well, don't people get together? Aren't they trying to get more cell coverage? And she said, no. Nope. And I, I checked with everybody I met when I was out there. I spent about three weeks there this summer with neighbors. I asked people, and they said, yeah, cell service, cell service is pretty crappy here, but, you know, we live with it. We get along with it. You know, real estate values are great. The place looks great. We don't have cell towers all over, which would just ruin the landscape forever. You know, we, we get by. We, we've been here for generations, and this is just, you know, an inconvenience, but we live with it. And people still move there. Real estate's booming. All of the businesses are still there on the main street. And, um, you know, people make their choice. They say, well, you know, we'd rather have the nice view and maintain our community the way we've had it for generations rather than putting up all these towers just to, for a little extra convenience. So I just wanted to share that with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Next. My name is Robert Rovner, 4 King Street. I wasn't going to talk today, but since Mo Erickson spoke about the parking on Pine Point Road, um, I have a little bit different take, but one of the things that concerns me about all this decision-making you folks are going to be making is the repercussions that we're suffering in Pine Point now, um, or what we may be suffering. Because there's a plan down there to possibly eliminate the nestling duck and the food processing, processing, lobster processing plant that's next to it now, expand to that location and double the size of the building and bring it out towards the road. Now, two and a half years ago, this wouldn't have been possible, maybe three. But the, between the zoning board and the ordinance committee, they changed it down there. It allows this to happen. Um, I moved here permanently two years ago and bought a house seven years ago. Um, when the plan was in the paper that they had changed the zoning, it was sold to the public as this plan, master plan to bring in a community center down there. That's obviously not the plan right now. So this is what can happen when forethought is not given as to actually all these other things that might become available when dollars come into play. And that is where we're faced today with this other cell phone stuff now. So I can only urge everybody to try and think of the future and not just the immediate need or what it's going to do right now because it's going to have a repercussion down the line. Pine Point has changed dramatically since I've lived there. 
You've got multi-million dollar homes going in. A lot of money is coming into the area. It's not the same small fishing village that it was many years ago, even when I bought my house seven years ago. The odor that comes out of this plant downwind is horrible. And that's what we're faced with now. And it's even going to be worse. So I just urge your compassion and your understanding and hopefully some thoughtfulness going into the future. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hello. Hi. My name is Ted Bennett. I live on 31 Tenney Lane. Um, I want to express a lot of gratitude for this process. I appreciate your roles in this very much, the roles of the planning board. And you're a very likable guy. And I sincerely hope that any comments we make aren't taken personal. Um, we, we know you all have a job to do, even the blood-sucking attorneys. Um, <laughs> but this isn't personal. This is about our town. These are our concerns. Um, I use a cell phone. Um, most of us in this room have probably lived more than 50% of our lives without cell phones. Um, we've gotten our jobs done. Life will go on if we don't have a 100% cell phone signal everywhere we go. This is just a fact of life. It's, we'll never have complete coverage everywhere. I would urge the council, the board, to consider this. Um, I think the underwriting message you're hearing from the town's people, the residents of Scarborough, is that we like these towers. We like improved signal. It's not a bad thing. I'm not objecting to that. I don't think anybody here is. But we'd like them to stay in the cell, uh, the industrial zones. I think Dan mentioned it's worth looking at a way to improve it from the industrial zone, maybe a gargantuan tower. Who knows? Fine. Um, but I don't want it abutting my residential zone in a rural zone. It's just something I would ask you to, to please hear our voices on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm Lisa Boxer, and I'm fighting a cold, so my apologies. Um, I also want to express my gratitude. Thank you for all of the hard work that you are doing. Thank you for not rushing and for sending it back to the planning board. Um, everyone that I've met with on this issue has been incredibly open-minded, and thank you for taking our concerns to heart. So it's not an easy job you have. Uh, like a lot of people, I arrived at this particular issue pretty late in the game, pretty late in the process, and I've come to understand a little bit more about why that is, because um, over the years I've taken a special interest in the issue of cell phone towers and municipalities making decisions about them and residents opposing them. And in each case, the wireless company proposes an individual tower in a specific location, and then the residents become aware of that tower, and then the conversation begins. Um, in this case, there wasn't a single tower, there wasn't a single location, so there was no targeted school or neighborhood, as is the case in other towns. Here we're really looking down the barrel of a very broad wholesale zone change. And that is the issue for a lot of people I've talked to. Excuse me, I have to cough, I'm sorry. <clears throat> or at least clear my throat. Um, if passed, these zoning changes could really effectively cut off any conversation and any future conversation by putting the power in the hands of the wireless industry rather than in the hands of our town leaders. And then there's no turning back. Um, thankfully, though, the zone change trigger has not been pulled yet because you guys are the ones that I want making the decisions about where towers should and shouldn't go in our town. Um, not Verizon, not AT&T. Once cell towers become an allowable use in the RF district, for example, it's the wireless providers and not you and not the planning board um, who will control tower placement as long as they meet the performance standards and the setback requirements. And then resident, residents like me will be worried about you know, whether or not a suitable neighboring lot will have a cell phone tower and whether a suitable utility pole will have an antenna array. Um, incidentally, I do want to voice my especially strong opposition to step three that allowed antenna arrays on utility poles uh, because that could allow them even closer to, to neighborhoods and homes. Um, I know that's not what any of you intended, but there's definitely a reason why the wireless companies like 
the original ordinance. Um, so I hope that you'll start with the 150-foot towers, um, I agree with Ted, taller if necessary, 200 feet in industrial zones. Um, since cell towers are industrial and commercial facilities, I do believe they belong in industrial and commercial zones, um, business zones, light industrial zones. And then if more coverage is needed, expanding to um, suitable town-owned property. And I really, you know, bottom line, I know that we all care deeply about this town, and I'm not opposed to better cell coverage. Um, I'm just opposed to doing it in a way that ties in the hands of the people that I elected to protect me and my family. So thank you again for all of the hard work that you're doing on this, and I hope that you continue to work with us in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi, I'm Suzanne Foley Ferguson. Um, so I guess one of the things, um, everybody's saying thank you, and I did want to say thank you as well, but I'll say it really quickly, especially um, Mr. Benedict, who just expressed that he had had a change of heart because that shows that he's really listening to the community and the voices and listening and, and sort of gathering information about it. Um, I think the manager took it back to what was our policy objective and that, that the council had, had decided that it was our objective to expand coverage. Um, I think from the community's perspective, we didn't hear that as a community conversation. Maybe it was in a, in a council goals session or maybe it was uh, in an ordinance committee session. I don't think the person who said black back room deals meant to implicate anybody, um, or maybe they did, I don't know, I can't speak for them. But, um, but if wherever that conversation started, I don't think the full community ever talked about that policy, because the policy conversation is really the comprehensive plan. And the comprehensive plan and the visioning and the long-range planning committee, those are where policy discussions take place. Those policies didn't say, let's expand uh, cell coverage. So if you're hearing complaints, that's one thing, but it doesn't, it isn't consistent with our, so I would take it back even further. One is, is cell towers in, in, in all of these zones consistent with your comprehensive plan? Because if it's not, it won't be legal if it's not. So I was hoping that maybe you guys might get the opinion of the long range planning committee to see whether it was consistent with a comprehensive plan and that, and what their opinion was. Because there is another way, instead of doing it this huge broad way, if you are getting complaints over in the West, for instance, you can identify a location and change that to a commercial zone. And then you continue to allow cell towers. Or as Dan has talked about in step two, considering the, locating them in the industrial or crossroads districts, perhaps take a piece of that crossroad districts and make that commercial or industrial, take a partial out west, you know. So there are other ways, and I guess, and I haven't heard anybody talk about that, so I don't know if you guys considered it or not, but to, to what zoning is, is you can go to the state and you can find out what, what zoning laws are meant for, and you can also read our own purposes of what a zoning ordinance is, and it really is to separate zones, and residential zones, are not appropriate for commercial uses. We wouldn't put a Walmart down at Prout's Neck or even over in the middle of, you know, broad over by Broadturn Farm. They wouldn't want to be there probably, but I guess what I'm saying is there is separations of uses. And while this is a little bit different in terms of the law and, this, and what's appropriate, um, we should be keeping cell towers uh, separate. So changing a zone to allow that is, is one way of doing it. Um, you also talked about what is reasonable expansion. To me, reasonable expansion is there are three or four zones with, that allow them right now, the industrial zones. Are there towers there? Nope. Okay, let's see exactly what Dan just said. Let's see what would happen if we put those towers in there. Because frankly, no matter how many towers we have or whatever, as one of the people indicated, you're not going to always get 100% coverage. That's just the way it is. Um, one of the things, I'm going to stop now because a lot of people said what I'm going to say. Um, but the one thing I really, what, what will frustrate me right now is that we, ha we possibly have the, as the other guy said, blood-sucking attorney sitting here. Um, 
they'll get the last word because they'll be sitting here and tell you how you're not allowed to talk about any kind of issues. But the, all of the things I just brought up, zoning issues and state issues, those are all covered by law, and they are very valuable. We all know that our, our house values are going to go down if, we put a, if cell towers are near us. We have studies to prove that. Um, and I just wanted to point out the Verizon coverage map and the AT&T coverage map all says we are, have good coverage. Okay? Now, what's interesting is good coverage isn't necessarily 100% um, coverage, but there's good, poor, fair, terrible, extended. Good. And I guess we as a community need to decide what's, what's right in our, um, in our residential neighborhoods and whether we need it or not. So I appreciate this. Again, I, I was hoping that maybe you might be able to ask opinions of the long-range planning in terms of consistency at where they might cite a commercial zone to allow a tower or something based on the information you guys already got. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? One tall guy. <laughs> How you doing? I'm Paul Callahan. I'm at uh, One Farmhouse Road. I've been in that, uh, I'm a native Mainer from Portland, but I've lived there about uh, nine months and uh, that's on the east side of Route 1. And just a couple of quickie things here. I went down and I saw the little Wiley Field, and I know in my neighborhood, which is the Baruby built, there's a 30 houses in there, and I'm seeing a lot of young kids showing up. I'm the old man of the neighborhood, but there's a lot of little kids coming through. And that, that cute little Wiley playground, you know, with a little baseball field, I think behind it with a great big uh, Frankenstein of a tower, behind there isn't going to be a good thing and I think that's the uh, the Benjamin Trust I know they've got a good hit on that trust we love it all but I think they're looking for one more little piece of cake and that is can we get a tower in there to end it right behind that cute little Wiley field and of course with all those homes there I think it's it's not a good idea thanks anybody else I'm Stuart Cobb from Portland, and um, it's been four years since I've battled a life-threatening brain tumor, and my doctor, Colt, has strongly believed that was from my heavy cell phone use. It developed a tumor on my head the size of a tennis ball, and I've heard the industry say they can disguise these towers as chimneys, church steeples, my wife and I are in the market looking for a house, and I know if I knew there was a tower and a chimney, or no way, I'd live in that town. Uh-uh. So you'd really dis be discouraging a lot of people from buying property here. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ron Bono from 6 Old Neck Road in Scarborough. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to comment today, and the turnout seems to be terrific, and I think it would be even greater if it was held in the evening. Um, and uh, word is getting out, and I think that's what's happening here, is that people are becoming aware of what's going on. Um, I've lived in Scarborough for about 40 years now, and I'm currently in the process of building a home by the marsh off the Black Point Road. Um, I hired a Scarborough builder, I hired a Scarborough kitchen company to put in my kitchen, I hired a Scarborough flooring company to put in my flooring. I've hired virtually everybody from Scarborough to build this house. When I bought the property last year, this was zoned in an RF zone, and that's why I bought it and invested a lot of money in building in Scarborough, a brand new home in Scarborough, uh, and then to find out that zoning potentially is going to change for this area or that a tower could be allowed at the sewage treatment plant as one possibility, I would have never purchased that property and nor would I ever, ever built a home on that piece of property. There needs to be some stability for people when they buy land or property in Scarborough that if it's zoned RF, it stays RF. And to then to make these changes and allowing potentially cell towers in areas 
that are zoned RF is, is, is beyond belief, quite frankly. And I think the problem could be solved by just removing cell towers and RF zones. Uh, there are enough other areas, or if there are areas that are currently um, zoned RF that need to be changed that haven't been built up yet, if there exist such those areas in town, we can look to change the zoning that allows, that, that makes it commercial or industrial, it would allow towers. But to take an RF zone that's been in existence for many, many years, have people invest money in these neighborhoods, then to find out, oh, geez, by the way, we might be putting a 150-foot tower up your backyard. It just doesn't seem right. And um, so I hope that the Ordinance Committee uh, considers uh, that issue. And like I say, I think by removing the RF zone from any towers would eliminate the outcry that we're hearing today and that we'll continue to hear in weeks, in weeks ahead. I was at the last town council meeting and we had one person from the community speak uh, for uh, cell towers and, and RF zones. The other two folks were from the cell companies and we probably will hear from them today. We have not heard from any um, proponents of cell tower or cell towers or increased coverage in town uh, from residents today. So I find that rather interesting as well. Um, um, I, I think um, uh, Mr. Benedict made a good point is that if we open the window to cell towers in these areas, RF areas, you were going to run into the same issue Cape Elizabeth is now running into uh, being sued by cell companies. And you just open that window and they're going to go through that window and they're going to go for the gusto. And it just, it's going to create problems for the town. And, you know, I, I think we have to look I was looking at the latest issue of Down East Magazine and they listed, you know, Maine scenic 60 locations in the state of Maine that are scenic. Number six, Scarborough Marsh. And, you know, you look at that and you say, all right, we'll put a cell tower there, 150 foot cell tower, cell tower there. And, you know, is that going to make Down East Magazine? Maybe it doesn't matter to some people, but it does to me. I look at the town's website. You look at the beautiful pictures on the town's website. I don't see one cell tower in all those pictures I go through, scroll through on the town's website. So, uh, you know, we'd just like you to consider, you know, removing the RF zone from any consideration of having cell towers. And I, and I think, you know, instead of selling off our natural resources to get a one or two extra bars of coverage on the cell phone, I think it's a crime, personally. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, we're going to close the public comments. Other new business. Do we need to vote to send it to? Do I, I need don't to think so. This matter is scheduled for the next council, town council meeting. It's on the agenda. That's uh, right. that's not going to change. So right. uh, it would be helpful, perhaps, if this committee could report and provide recommendation to the full council as to what should happen next. Okay. Um, I mean, that could take form uh, uh, in many different ways, including specific amendments to further improve the ordinance as it currently sits. And, um, could be a recommendation to table it, could be a recommendation to defeat it. But uh, I, I, it certainly would be appropriate for some sort of recommendation from this group to the council. Okay. As I, I observe, I think all seven members of council are here, so I'm not sure if there's any secrets here. And I think, I think I, I mean, we, I think we know what we want our recommendations to the council to be. So. Um, then I might suggest a, a, we, a vote of this body yeah. would, would be appropriate. Madam Chair, can I? Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, you know, I'm an all alternate, but um, I can speak to this issue. And um, what I think that my recommendation um, to the committee would be to um, table. Um, any further action, uh, not send it to the council as of now. Uh, and I believe uh, scheduling a joint workshop of the planning board and the um, council for our next meeting, uh, August 3rd. September 3rd. I mean, I'm sorry, September 3rd um, at 6 o'clock. Um, because uh, I uh, met with um, two planning board members. They have a lot of good ideas um, that I don't think we frankly thought about to, uh, that will 
uh, relieve a lot of the uh, frustration of the public and uh, bring this to a better conclusion. Uh, that's my two cents. I'd be glad to push you on. Thank you. Do you have anything to say? No, I, w I would um, support what uh, Chairperson Sullivan is saying. I, I would definitely recommend that we recommend that this be tabled. Yeah, getting further input and a joint meeting, and I'd also like to, I would like to personally get more information out of the providers. I know it's considered proprietary information, but I'd like to know more about exactly where locations would be that you guys are thinking, and Gail, are that. thinking of putting the towers um, and working uh, from there. So that's my opinion. Um, I think you were out of the room actually when we had talked about um, originally the plan was for us to the ordinance committee to send it back to the planning board for them to look it over, fine tune it, have it come back to us for one final thing before and then table it next <coughs> week. But your recommendation of a workshop I think is going to work a lot better than that. After speaking with the chair of the uh, planning board, um, and uh, Susan Auglis, they really, really want to meet with the council um, as a whole and at the work, at, you know, or if you just want the ordinance, that's fine, but they want a chance to go, they have some great ideas that they shared with me and um, I think it will um, lessen the frustration of the public. Um, and to that point, um, the cell phone providers um, have got the next two weeks to um, uh, meet with staff, I would say. They can meet with uh, Tom and Dan, so it's in confidentiality, and mm -hmm. share um, the, you know, work with them on what sites would work because they're going to be co-located. They're not going to have the opportunity to throw towers all over town. I want to make that clear. Uh, we want to stay away from residential areas. Mm -hmm. So it's crucial that they um, take this opportunity to uh, meet with staff and work with them because if they don't, this is going to be a missed opportunity for them. When are you proposing this joint? September 3rd. September 3rd. But that's up to you. I just, this is my suggestion. Yes, please. My two cents. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to, to table this almost indefinitely until all the answers to the satisfactory have been brought forward and in conjunction with that September 3rd, 6 o'clock council and the planning board have a public meeting to discuss all the points that they now have or will have and I'd like to get information back from the cell phone play people because as I said before I've got a tower two miles north and two miles west and I get no coverage so I guess in conjunction I'd like to have a guarantee of sorts what we're going to get with the new towers for coverage. So that's your motion? Yes. Okay. It's a long motion, but I guess I'll second it. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? It's a vote. Um, okay. So, other new business. I think just, we're just, just to finalize that, would you like me to write something up that could be provided to the council um, at next Wednesday? Please. Thank you, Tom. Yep. Um, no, they no, they're they're very angry. Good. Um, uh, so I think we can just can we just just um, new business? Well, we can you and I can get together and figure that out. Make an adjournment. <laughs>
Can adjourn. somebody make an adjournment? I move that we adjourn. Second. Done. <laughs>